Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young, licensed clinical social worker. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, thank you so much for joining me. This is episode nine, and today I'm joined by Tim Winnicky. When I met Tim, he kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and that's one of the reasons why I did this podcast episode. He knows it, we talk about it, and I think it's really a beautiful example of how when we allow ourselves to get to know people, the most amazing things can unfold. I'm not going to share too much information. I'm just going to let you experience it yourself. I want to tell you a little bit about Tim. He spent the last two decades learning with and helping people navigate the hard times that life throws at them. He served as an advocate, representative, airman, sergeant, mentor, organizer, educator, and counselor. He uses his passion and education to empower people with skills and knowledge that they need to find the best way to move forward. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Tim. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much for being here today. I was so excited when we started to have that exchange over Messenger. I got really excited and wanted to bring you on the show. Mm -hmm. Listeners, what I'm going to do, and I'm feeling really torn, this is new for me about how much of a backstory do I give, but it feels like it's really relevant. So we're going to try this out. If it doesn't work, then I'll know for next time not to do it. But I think the backstory really leads us up to this beautiful place where Tim is going to share kind of where the intersection of the story starts. A few months ago, because I knew I wanted to launch a podcast and I needed some support, I asked in a Facebook group that I'm at if there were people that wanted to join a smaller podcast group. So there were a few of us that started this podcast group on Facebook in order to support each other a little bit more closely than we could in the larger group. We had our first online meeting. Tim wasn't in this meeting. There were two highly sensitive people that were in it, just happened to happen by chance. So we had this lovely connection. Then I got a message from Tim asking to join the group. And so the next online meeting, Tim one of the other highly sensitive people and myself were on the call. Tim, feel free to jump in at any time. I'm trying to figure out how to tell a story and not make it a monologue. So at any time, please feel free to jump in. I'm just having fun listening to your side of it. <laughs> I know. I have this feeling um, that you know Tim was having this very unilateral experience and is a highly sensitive person. There were about 15 things going on for me in a number of our interactions, which is why I wanted to do this. It feels like kind of a little bit of a story before the story. On this online call that we had, Tim was sharing about what was going on. The first meeting with the other highly sensitive people, most highly sensitive people are pretty conscientious and we read facial images and body body language and we kind of take notice of time. And Tim was just sharing what was going on and I kept looking at the clock and I was getting anxious. And then I started getting resentful because in my mind, I wanted Tim to be able to acknowledge that we all needed a time to talk. As a highly sensitive person, it can be really hard for me to assert myself. And it's like, I want people to know what my needs are, but having to assert myself is not always very easy. And then I flipped into wanting the other highly sensitive person to take care of my needs. And, you know, while it's okay to have these thoughts, those are not really realistic. Part of why I want to do this interview is because you get to see what the intersection is when HSPs and non-HSPs interact and all the things that go on and how we can learn to manage these. After stewing for a little bit and feeling really afraid that I wasn't going to get my time, I figured like, I need to say something. I jumped in and it worked out fine. But because this was such an uncomfortable interaction for me, I thought I really need to make a video about this. Made a short video, put it on my YouTube page, put it on Facebook, which is where I post most of my stuff. And Tim and I continued to interact in the group. The next time we had our online meeting, there was a real shift. And I thought, oh my gosh, did you see my video? And did you know I was talking about him? Like, I didn't call you out in it, Tim. And I was really clear that this was about my experience. And I think I even asked you, like, did you watch my video? Do you remember that? I remember you asking (laughs) and feeling a little bad that, no, 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 I hadn't. (laughs) And I thought, 
because, you know, again, it's really challenging that I want to have these real life experiences that go on with me and to share them with people. But I haven't really had the chance of when somebody knows that the video was actually about them. We continue to move forward. Tim launches his podcast before I do. I listen to an episode. And while he did a great job, the story personally didn't resonate with me. And I really struggled with how do I be supportive? And like, it just wasn't my thing. I think we navigated that pretty well. How was it for you, Tim, receiving feedback from me? I, I think it was pretty accurate. I mean, the the podcast is designed for stories about me to other men. Mm-hmm. The support group where it's primarily women and getting all to listen to it, it. It's nice to get the feedback on the humanity of the stories mm-hmm. and the acceptance that it's not for everybody. Right, right. And the purpose of this podcast group, which was just so beautiful, is when we start to do new things and we reach out, what I call the gremlins come up for us that tell us, you know, nobody wants to hear you. You have nothing to say. Everybody's gremlins are different. As I watched two of the other people in the group launch their podcast, these fears came up for them. Fears came up for me. So it really ended up being a very supportive place where we could talk about the fears that were coming up and really provide some great support and encouragement for each other. So anyways, Tim launched, I gave him the feedback. I felt like I found a way that I could give him feedback that was supportive and like, "Mm, not really for me. Then moving forward, I was getting ready to start launching, but I was feeling really intimidated with the editing software. And so I posted in the group, like, how's it going for everybody? Is it really hard to use? And Tim had volunteered to jump on an online call with me and do a screen share and allow me to watch him edit. You know, very generous of him to spend his time doing this. So we did this and the story that he edited was a personal narrative and I was really drawn into the story and it kind of piqued my interest. It was very different than the first episode that I had listened to. And then in our group, somebody else had listened to all of this podcast and really said how much she loved it. And I thought, maybe I really need to give this a second, second listen. So I went through and listened to all of the solo episodes and then uh, one of the episodes that he did with a buddy. And all of a sudden, my experience of you, Tim, totally changed. It's not like you're going to walk around and tell me all these intimate things when we're meeting in a group, but I really got a sense of what you experienced and the depth and the insight and the feelings. And it's like you'd share something and I'd have feelings because just how you beautifully expressed it. Hmm. And I also got a chance to see how you work as a therapist, what your theoretical orientation is, because that was kind of peppered in with it. Mm-hmm. When my husband gets home from work, we walk the dog a couple times a night. And that's usually when I do most of my prattling about the day. And I was telling him, like, I'm just so impressed. And it was such a different experience from, you know, my first experience with you online was like, this guy isn't giving me a chance to talk <laughs> to the launch of your podcast going like, I don't really relate to these stories. Like, I liked you. But then yeah. having a chance to listen to these stories, like, oh, my gosh, all of a sudden, something really shifted for me. So this is where our joint story starts. So I sent you a message in Messenger saying, I just feel like I have a totally different sense of who you are. I love the storytelling. I I shared a lot of the things that I've shared now. And it was when I got your message back a couple of days, that's kind of where this story picks up. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, it was hard to hear. Um, mm-hmm. the, so part of the the thing that I think it's important that the listeners know is that uh, you and some of the other members of our group have been pretty proactive and laying out the groundwork for your podcast with effort, vigor, and guidance. I kind of sort of found my way falling into this group of other podcasters to get support, mm-hmm. but hadn't been able to do the courses and, and get some of the groundwork laid. I was the first of our group to kind of launch. We had another member that had previous launched a podcast and was restarting one. I missed just a number of what felt like watching you all do it that were important things to do to make sure that the launch was going to go well because I didn't really know any better. Okay. It was starting to get disheartening, right? I had 50 people that sounded excited about it, that were going to listen to it, that were going to give me feedback on it. And then I was only getting like 30 or 40 listens an episode. Mm-hmm. Not even all the people that had kind of promised that they were going to support the podcast and tell me what was going on with it. Right. And just to let the listeners know that when a podcaster launches a podcast, there's a certain amount of time. And if you have the stats on this, Tim, feel free to jump in. 
that iTunes looks at new podcast releases. And when there's a new podcast, when people subscribe and they rate and review, it bumps the podcast up and you get a chance to be in Apple iTunes new and noteworthy. So yeah. the number of downloads that people um, download counts for your statistics and that, you know, it's suggested that you get a launch team together and those people listen, they rate and review, they share that to other people because when you start your podcast, it's really important that everybody knows about it. And it's really a challenging piece that as podcasters, you know, Tim and I are both therapists first. And so now we're podcasting. Then you have to learn how to do interviews and then you have to learn how to edit your software. And then you have to learn how to do the social media posts. And then you have to have a launch team. Like it's really using so many new skills and tools and the learning curve is very, very steep. So back to you, Tim. Yeah. And the, the trick with it is, is that it's, it's not the end of the world if the initial three months doesn't go well. Generally speaking, what we've learned from the other podcasters that we associate with is it just takes longer to build up an audience then mm -hmm. because you're not advertised in kind of the, the Apple on iTunes and different places. What's funny about that is the, the classes that we had access to and the people we had access to, they've been podcasting for quite a while. Well, and it turns out that it's even harder now to get to break that threshold mm -hmm. because now the podcasting field is so full of different people telling different stories. And the idea that like Patricia and I are going to compete with Alan Alda's new podcast for new and exciting just isn't really relevant anymore. Right, right. So it's just a lot slower build. But all that said, I watched as a, a good friend of ours uh, that's been really supportive of both of us, Michael launched her podcast. And her numbers were fantastic. And I was on her launch team and listening to her content, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it if you're, if you're looking at kind of how to clean up your life and clean out your space. But she did everything like you're supposed to. And so that I watched her go through this and watched her post kind of her numbers, right as Patricia sends me this really warm, wonderful message about how she feels so much closer to me after hearing these stories and how wonderful they are. And the timing to me was a little suspect when I got that message. What do you mean suspect? Uh, because it felt, um, because I was at a really low point. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, are you, are you just getting that I'm having a hard day and trying to be nice? Mm, right? <laughs> like that, that I don't, I don't know whether this is someone trying to be supportive of this is someone that really is listening or if it's just they noticed something in me and decided that today was the day that I needed to hear it. So this is what I call the story that we make up in our head. Right. Because So you made an assumption that I knew that you were struggling and that, you know, I was reaching out out of pity or trying to make you feel better. Right. Where from my perspective, I hadn't been that into your podcast. And then after <laughs> having you, you know, let me watch you edit and hearing some story and then hearing Michael, whose podcast is called Let's Purify. Yeah. Her name is Michael Spencer. So it's a great podcast. She's actually, I'm interviewing her tomorrow. So. There you go. Well, I think for me, it wasn't even so much about what I thought was going on for you. For me, the way I usually frame that story is it's my depression. Mm. Right? I've struggled with kind of mild depression my whole life for my kind of approach to therapy with the narrative view is it's my depression trying to convince me of a story that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, no one's, no one's going to be into this. So clearly it's just out of some kind of pity or something. Yeah. And so the nice thing is, is I've been at this long enough with my, my struggles that I was able to pretty quickly cut through that and just like, well, let me just tell her what's going on. So it's hard to hear. Here's uh, seeing Michael's success has been wonderful. I, I really am supportive of her and it hurts a little that she's doing so well and mine just isn't taking off the way that I'd like it to. Sure. And that whole thing about comparison, it is so hard because we can't not compare. Right. And every single time I compare, it does not work out well for me. But the reason why we're having this conversation is I think it's such a beautiful illustration of this really unfolding of the first time that I met with you and kind of felt like you're not even giving me any time to talk to this beautiful response that you gave me that was just so honest and vulnerable. And this is the reason why I wanted to have the podcast supporter group. This is the reason why I wanted to have a podcast 
because Mm. we all experience stuff like this when we want to reach out and we want to stretch and grow and then the gremlins come and then we do it and then the gremlins come. And it's not about not having gremlins. It's not about not having the disappointment. It's about finding safe places where you can show up and connect and be vulnerable. And in that is this beautiful connection and this place of, I'm not even, do you have a word for it, Tim? Uh, Acceptance mostly. Yeah. The, the, the frame that tends to work really well for, for me and for my clients is that there's, there's no happiness without sadness. There's no connectivity without isolation. Right. And it's not about not having those things. It's about recognizing them, learning what you need to from them so that you can move forward. Right. And for me, I think what my experience was is it felt like everybody else was having a happy life. So if I was struggling, I had to withdraw and I got mm-hmm. messages that I needed to withdraw. And, and we'll do an episode on this later on, but literally because my mom was a single mom that was really overwhelmed was a highly sensitive person, didn't know it was incredibly anxious mm-hmm. that if I cried, I had to go to my room and I had a blackboard in front of my door that I was allowed to write my feelings on, but I couldn't talk about them. So mm-hmm. I really got the message that anything that's not happy and pleasant, you need to go away and you need to hide when you have it. We have this setup that happens in our relationships that we don't want to show up and allow people to see us when we're struggling. And the reality is life is about struggle. And mm-hmm. when we have safe people that we can show up and say, like, I'm struggling, the gremlins are up, and we have people that can allow us to be in that space and then they share their own gremlins, this amazing, powerful connection starts. Then we learn that it's not about trying to hit the happy points. It's about learning how to walk through the struggle times and get that support and connection. And then it kind of doesn't matter whether you have the highs and lows because you learn to lean into both of those processes. And there's not fear around the times that feel what I call more contractive when I pull back and I, my energy isn't as high and I'm not reaching out as much, but I still have that need for connection. And that was what I loved about the message that you sent back to me. Mm. Well, and I think that speaks to what, how real connection is built. For me, the people that I'm closest with and the people that I feel uh, safest with and the people that I'll go to the end of the earth for aren't the folks that everything's been good with. Mm -hmm. Someone generally has to kind of make a mistake because we're all human. We're all going to make them. I expect that from the world. But then they have to show me they're going to repair. And so the people that are most important in my life, the friends that I've kept over my moves all across the world through the military and everything else are the folks that have gone through some things with me, shown me some things and been there for me when I'm honest about something that's hurt me. Mm -hmm. And that's where a real connection happens. Otherwise we all just end up with people that may be fun, right? There's plenty of people in my life that have never kind of crossed that threshold that I enjoy. Absolutely. But they're not the ones I'm going to go to during a crisis. They're not the ones I'm going to go to on a hard day. And they're not really the ones that are going to help me fully celebrate the big wins in life because they haven't been there for the losses. Right, right. It's a whole new paradigm, though, because I I really, I mean, do you see this too? I think that there's such a strong message in our society and especially with social media that you know, nobody posts on Facebook. I stayed in my pajamas all day and I ate, I ate a carton of Ben and Jerry's or, you know, it's been two days since I showered or, you know, I'm feeling like, you know, no one loves me and nobody cares. Like you don't see those posts on social media. So when we are struggling and we happen to go on social media, it looks like everybody's having these shiny, beautiful lives. I think it even reinforces even more that, you know, it's not okay to struggle and who who are we going to tell about that unless you already have that belief system that struggles just part of life and you've got a really good support system that's set up. Yeah. And I, the, the one I noticed with, with Facebook is there is the algorithm that Facebook does, right? Where it's only going to show you the things that you like. And it's really hard to push a like button on somebody struggling. Mm-hmm. Right? What do you mean? So Facebook has an algorithm where it tries to feed you on your newsfeed, the 20 people you engage with the most. Mm-hmm. And most of us will like the kitten picture, the dog picture, the kids pictures, not so much when someone says, oh, you know, my life is hard right now. 
Mm -hmm. because you don't want to push like the like button and send them the message of like, we're happy you're suffering. That doesn't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. When some of those posts do get attention, the person making them basically get fire hosed with interactions from acquaintances, right? I think the average user has something like two to 300 connections on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And so one of their posts goes big, like, oh, you know, I lost my father this month. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they have this huge post where this outpouring of support comes and it's just too much. Or I'll just take me, for instance, a year and a half ago, I lost my grandmother and she, me, her and I were very, very close. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I did kind of the obligatory post on Facebook of, you know, hey, we lost this person because a number of my friends knew her. I actually had to stop checking my Facebook because I didn't want to share any more of the pain. And so I had this moment where there was all this outpouring of support for my loss for her, but it was mostly from strangers who never knew her. That's interesting because I just recently had a very different experience. So this is just kind of fascinating to me that I spent all day Monday in the ER with someone that I love very much and um, it was a life-threatening situation they're fine now but it was a really hard day and because it wasn't my story to tell who I was with or why I was there I just needed some support and I posted on on Facebook you know prayers needed and Mm. I got an outpouring of you know love and support and when I went back to Facebook while I was still in the ER and read them I cheered up and some of these people I know, some of these people I've, I've met through being online for a few years and establishing relationships, some of them I didn't. Mm-hmm. But I really felt the love and support. And it was, like I said, I, I started to cry. The person that I was with that was in the hospital asked if everything was okay. And I had explained what happened. So it's interesting that you and I had a very different experience. And I just felt really held and supported and felt like, People were there for me during this really stressful time. And being a highly sensitive person, all my nerves were on fire. I'm really great in a crisis, but it really wrecks my body. And so feeling like I had this support felt just lovely. So it's funny that you and I had a a different take on a a similar type of situation. I think for me, uh, there are points where I need that reassurance to fight the imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to go do a big speaking event, uh, I, I think I did something similar when I was taking my boards for licensure where I was like, Hey, uh, I'm going to go do this. And I just really need some, some backup and that outpouring mm-hmm. from the acquaintance level or just the, you know, the we're with you mm-hmm. sign. And I, and I feel like for me that I'm not a religious person. So that's what prayers generally are for me is I'm, we're with you. We're thinking of you. Mm-hmm. Those are really helpful. I think I never really know which one I need. I totally did. Yeah. I mean, I also reached out to my support system, and it's the first time I asked my husband to leave work and come to the hospital because I needed his support. I didn't even mm. know how the person that was there felt about him being there, but I was clear that I needed someone to support me. So I mobilized my immediate support team that also felt like I just kind of wanted a bigger call to action. Yeah. Well, it's almost like you're good at it by now. Well, and that was that was the other point of this podcast is or wanting to do this episode is one of the things that I found really, really helpful is I think since highly sensitive people, we're 20 percent of the population. So we're generally in the minority. We've got all this processing that goes on that most other people don't experience. And so we often feel like we don't fit in and we don't belong until we find our tribe. One of the things that I found really helpful is I've started a couple of closed Facebook groups. I've got a mastermind group. We've got the podcaster support group. I've created these safe places that are small and intimate where I get my needs met and I'm able to really show up and support other people. Mm. And I struggle because the only thing that's the same about highly sensitive people is we're all different, but there are a number of things that we share that are similar and having other HSPs around us having places where we use our gifts and talents and they're received in a positive manner are really important. And Mm so I'm finding that all of these places where I've set up to not only get support, but give support really create that connection for me. I have a really strong need for connection. I can't always find it out in the general population. So there are lots of ways that we can create kind of getting our tribe around us so that when we have these times that things are off, which is just part of life, We've got it. 
It, it's funny. I had never heard the term highly sensitive person until I met you and started talking with you. Mm-hmm. And when you invited me on this, I was, I was reading the questions on like how you identify as a highly sensitive person and what that looks like. And the first time that you got me thinking about it was I, I consulted with you about a client. Do you remember this? I don't. So I had a, a client who was a man struggling with being kind of more sensitive than most men mm-hmm. from a generation where that really wasn't encouraged. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, how fortuitous. Like I just met Patricia. Let me like, let me ask her about this. And it got me thinking about the frame for kind of where I've been mm-hmm. in my masculinity and my sensitivity and how I connect. And it was funny. I was thinking about my interactions just with the men in my family, how I continued to hug my grandfather after I was adolescent, even though his body language and everything about him let me know that that was uncomfortable for him. Mm-hmm. The minute you get a dirty joke, you're, you're now you know that women exist on that level. We're not supposed to touch anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's funny because that the label highly sensitive person has been leading up to this podcast has been very heavy for me. Tell me what heavy means to you. As though it's, it's kind of loaded, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Men are generally not supposed to be seen as emotional. We can get in trouble for being even emotionally aware. Sure. I've been kind of struggling with how to kind of answer some of the questions that we're coming into it about whether or not I identify as a highly sensitive person or not. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I still don't know. Yeah. So let me ask you this. And I I would love your uncensored thought. When you think of sensitive, what comes to mind? Uncensored. Uncensored for men, crybaby, Mm -hmm. all the insults from the playground. Sure. Sure. And as a guy, would you want to be called sensitive? No. Yeah. No, aware, skilled, like those are labels that I'll take, right? Right. But the the sensitive portion, that that feels almost like, um, you know, we use it in medical terminology, right? Like, Mm -hmm. right, like I I have this thing that that makes it harder for me to function in the world. Yeah, and Dr. Elaine Aaron is the one that coined the term highly sensitive person. And then as time has gone on and they've done more, more research, the other term that they're using is sensory processing sensitivity. And, you know, Ted Zeff, who also has written books about the sensitive male and is very prominent in the field, has said, like, he's talked to Dr. Aaron. It's like, we really wish you would have come up with something different because culturally sensitivity does not really bring up warm thoughts. And as I've been in the process of getting the logo for the For the podcast, you know, I've been really communicating clearly with the graphic designer, like I want the word sensitive as it's it's literally literally written to convey strength and creativity and Mm -hmm. vibrancy. Like I don't want it to be feminine and whimsy and weak and I want it to appeal to men and to women, but that's really a challenge because that's not what we think of when we think of the term sensitivity. Yeah. And it's hard culturally to take back some of those terms. Mm Mm-hmm. I ran into a similar thing around language on the term feminist, Mm -hmm. right? By the book definition of feminist that, you know, I believe in equality and I believe in the strength and character of everyone to contribute in ways that they can and should. Mm -hmm. I have found that socially it goes very poorly for me Mm -hmm. and to identify as a feminist. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, and I feel like the highly sensitive person, like there's, there's a lot of meat there of, do you need to be sensitive to be aware? Mm-hmm. Do you need to be sensitive to be able to connect? I don't know. And I literally had not thought of it before. I mean, the, the path to becoming a therapist for me was pretty long. I didn't end up stepping into the field until I was 35. Mm-hmm. But there were people telling me this is where I was going in high school. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because some of the things that you speak about in the podcast and you educate around highly sensitive people is that there is a skill set that comes with the ability to perceive these things and to feel these things and to have the language to share these things. Yeah. I want to have an investment, whether people meet the criteria for being highly sensitive, if you want to call yourself highly sensitive, 
that I don't feel very attached to that. What I do feel passionate about is just providing education and awareness around all the things that go on for us. There are four core traits that you need to meet in order to consider yourself highly sensitive. And it's not like there's the highly sensitive police that's going to come and say, like, (laughs) (laughs) you're out. (laughs) (laughs) What I find, and I think is, I've been really curious to know what the percentage of therapists are that are highly sensitive. So are there any of those questions that I sent you that you want to talk about? You can ask me anything you want. I guess what I would love to know, do you identify yourself as being sensitive? I do. Mm -hmm. I think the term that I would have coined back in college was dramatic Mm -hmm. because I was reacting in bigger, right? The way I would frame it now is I was very unregulated. Mm -hmm. The things that would come at me, I would, I would have very strong reactions to didn't have the skill or the example on how to react to them. Right. Right. There weren't men in my life that were emoting other than anger. And anger and joy, I think, are the two things that the men in my life modeled for me. And I think most men of my generation can relate to that. Sure. But of course, I didn't know how to regulate through the myriad of emotion. Right. And that emotional responsiveness, Mm -hmm. I think people want to use the word reactivity, but I really am very mindful about the language that I use is one of the four characteristics. Mm. If anybody's listening, and especially if you're a guy, if you go to hsperson.com, there's a self-test. And what Dr. Aaron recommends is if you're a guy and you take the test for the highly sensitive person and you don't rate as highly sensitive, but you suspect that you might be, you take the child version of the test and think back to when you were a child because just the things that you're talking about that men learn to bury those sensitivities because it does not serve them in this culture. There are cultures where sensitivity is highly valued. Ours just doesn't happen to be one of them. In my opinion, it's a little bit stronger than not serve. It's brutalized out of our young men. Yeah. Yeah. The the story that I really related to the first time it was mentioned to me was Jackson Katz's work. I'm not familiar with that. So give me a little bit more information. So Jackson Katz, back a while ago, he's most known for his TED Talk on violence against women and how it's a men's issue. But he has this movie, Tough Guys, where it goes into the cultural programming of men and how we highly sexualize them very early and we highly limit their ability and capacity for emotion outside of anger, happiness, and sexuality. We highly sexualize men? Yes. Can you say a little bit more about what that looks like? So every man is supposed to act as almost as though they're a predator. Okay. That every woman they walk by, they should be thinking about sex. Okay. That that's the expectation. So while women are sexualized as objects, men are sexualized as, as predatory. Okay. And we model that for them. And the example that he used that resonated with me when I was first watching this, getting into the field for, um, you know, trying to stop interpersonal violence was you see, you can watch it most with adolescent boys in middle school. And for my generation, this was certainly true. It's getting better, but you see a young man come to school and he's having a hard day, you know, for whatever reason, he's just not feeling well. And his best friend looks at him and he's kind of checked out and in his own world about whatever he's struggling with. And his friend punches him in the shoulder and says, what are you doing, man up? And that interaction actually makes the boy who's struggling feel better because someone noticed they were struggling. Mm. So then how does that play out? This is all new to me. So I'm slowly Mm -hmm. processing. So if I'm not engaging as much, it's just like I'm trying to take this information and put it someplace where it makes sense. So Boy is feeling sad, his friend punches him. So then what does that do for the boy who's feeling sad? Well, one, it's a negative interaction in that he has to start acting as though nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. But because the boy, at least the other boy, noticed that something was going on and took a minute to shore him up, Mm -hmm. that feels better. Okay. Someone noticed. So it gave me a reason to check back into the, the connection around me. Okay. So does that, so what does that look like then? Am I taking you off your story? Go ahead and finish and no, I'll ask my question. No, you're not. Mostly it reminded me of my middle school years. Mm-hmm. 
And that those were interactions that I remember. Mm -hmm. In those moments when I would be feeling dysregulated or I was having, or I was struggling, my life was, was really complicated back then. Mm -hmm. If someone hit me or made fun of me for being emotional, sometimes, depending on, on if it was a friend and they were doing it like, hey, buck up, you know, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're okay. Mm -hmm. Even if it was with violence or ridicule, that felt better. Or it allowed me to channel anger at being harassed. Okay. So I can either feel happy that somebody noticed mm -hmm. or angry because someone was abusing me. Okay. And that locks specifically men of my generation and back. I think this is happening less and less, which I'm really, really happy and thankful for. But it kind of locks in very early that binary response. This is good or bad. I'm angry or happy. Mm, got it. And it seems to me, and I'm not a guy, so please correct me, which is why I love having men on this show because I really want to understand, is it would seem to me that, I don't know what the word is without sounding judgmental, the healthy response would be a kid is feeling sad or angry. They can say I'm feeling sad or angry and they have somebody around them that mirrors that so that you authentically connect to what your feelings are and you get support around it. But what I'm hearing you say is for guys, that just doesn't work. So this whole way of identifying with your authentic or initial feelings kind of gets, it's like the train goes on a totally different track so that you don't even get in touch with what the feelings are. You have this whole different response pattern of mm -hmm. how you can interact with guys. Am I hearing you correctly? You are. You don't have the space to explore mm -hmm. and you don't have models to uh, witness. One of the things I tell the fathers I work with is 80% of what your kids learn from you is not what you tell them, but what they watch you do. Mm -hmm. And so we watch our fathers do the same kind of binary reaction, right? So that's our model. That's what we've perceived. Mm -hmm. And then we get stuck. It's particularly in adolescence when emotions are supposed to be roiling. They're supposed to be harder because your emotional and intellectual experience is broadening. And you're learning how to cope with the new things. Mm -hmm. Except our only model is binary still. And when another young man comes up and gives you a lever to pull to either get angry or happy, you take it. Mm -hmm. Because it's the only thing that's visible. Okay. And that really, like you said, that's when it locks in that pattern. So what was the shift for you? Because you've made that shift and I've seen you be vulnerable and express your feelings. So mm -hmm. what was that shift for you like? It was prolonged. I think the, I'm a very, very privileged man. I am big, I'm white, I'm loud. That's part of why in our first conversation, I dominated it with just talking too much, right? <laughs> you were just doing Tim. Yeah. <laughs> It took a long time to slowly chip that down on so many different aspects. And I think what finally pushed it over was when I was in the Air Force uh, in my later adulthood, like, you know, I think I was 28 when I joined mm -hmm. and I started doing the advocacy work and I had to learn how to support people who had been traumatized with no power to change what was going on for them. Mm hmm I literally had to learn how to just sit there with them, validate what they were feeling and show them that the entire world, particularly the entire world of men, weren't out to hurt them. Mm. And that was when I started getting more emotionality for myself because it's hard to hear, right? Vicarious trauma is a real thing. And being angry or happy really doesn't cover what you're feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. And luckily I was around other advocates. And in the military, there's a, there was a reasonable amount of male advocates that I could connect with and build a peer group with. And that was kind of the beginning of sussing out what I was feeling, how to utilize it, how to use it as that compass that's so effective for guiding us through life. Because I didn't know how to read it, right? My compass had two directions. That wasn't very helpful. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. I literally hadn't thought about it until just now in this conversation, but I think that was really when it changed over. It was learning the skills of how to develop empathy and listen guided me to hear myself. So if there are guys that are listening that, you know, are wanting to nurture more of that empathic 
I don't want to use the word sensitive. I don't know what other word to use. Do you have any suggestions of things that they can do to start to uh, nurture or cultivate that part of themselves? Absolutely. Empathy is a hard skill. There is a talent to empathy. And from everything that I've learned in our interactions and the different media you've put out and the, the tools you've given me, highly sensitive people have a talent for empathy. Mm -hmm. But empathy is a skill that needs to be developed. And the best book lately that I've found on it is actually Alan Alda's book. Really? And yeah. If I understood you, would I have this look on my face? Okay. And it's all about his exploration of using empathy to develop out better communication. And what I find is that for guys, we need a little bit more of a reason than just the permission to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It helps us if we have something concrete to grab onto. And what you find, or at least what I find and what my clients find, is as they develop out their empathetic skill on others, it allows them to better explore their own emotional states. It allows them to better connect with themselves. Because I don't think that your empathy and your exploration happens without community. Mm -hmm. So developing it out, starting it as just a skill exercise. The big thing I tend to assign my clients is identify one stranger's emotional state a day. So if you go to go get a coffee, after you're done getting the coffee, what was the barista feeling? Wow. And accepting that you're never going to know. They're not, they're not a triggering person in your life, right? They're, sure. they're somebody that you had a very brief interaction with. It's an uncomplicated relationship. Absolutely. And in, so it's low threat. And getting in the practice of it, all of a sudden they start having an interest in developing out more emotional language, right? Because all of a sudden angry and happy just aren't cutting it. Well, that person wasn't angry or happy. What were they feeling? Interesting. It's so much easier to be patient with other people than it is with ourselves. Absolutely. Do you use feeling charts so that they have the language? I like the emotion wheel. That's one of my favorites. The yeah. emotion wheel. Yeah. And if people want to find that, where can just they find Google it? it? There's about a dozen different emotion wheels that pop up just in Google image. I honestly don't think for general purposes, it matters what the arrangement is, how many primary emotions they define. It's a matter of having the language and understanding what the different emotional terms mean for you to help you identify it. But between using the emotion wheel and just practicing identifying external emotions in others, it's a really great lever to start having some patience with yourself and exploring your own emotions. Back in 93, I lived in a residential treatment facility for almost a year for my eating mm -hmm. disorder. And part of morning check-in was we had to use one of the seven feeling words to identify how we mm -hmm. were feeling. I did not have a clue what I was yeah. feeling. And if you go back to my childhood, like there wasn't language for it. And if you were feeling bad, you went to your yeah. room. And it really took a long time and I used to get contracts. My defenses were I'd use a wall of words, like I would just talk nonstop. Mm -hmm. And so I was only allowed to speak in like one sentence at a time. Oh and it was, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that we would have dates on Sunday that we could go out with someone who was in the community that was associated with the recovery home. And so I remember having a date with somebody I didn't know. and like, I could only speak in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but it was to try and break down those defenses because I couldn't tell you what I was feeling. And that the only way that I knew how to talk was to use, you know, literally a wall of words, but there was no emotional content in it. And I, I share this because I think that people make assumptions about people come with all of these skill sets. And like, I had to learn the entire language of emotions and expressing myself and figuring out what was going on and learning how to listen. And, you know, so we all have stories that a lot of people don't know what they are. And so it is really possible to develop a whole new skill set if you don't have it. Yeah. Well, and I love how you described it as if I was feeling bad, then I had to keep that to myself. And it's almost like its own binary, right? Where you just knew you didn't want to feel whatever it was you were feeling at that moment because you wouldn't be able to connect with your family. Yeah, I, I had to be isolated. Yeah, and that never gave you any appreciation for what your needs were that your emotions were driving at. So why would you develop the language around it? Well, it wasn't even being modeled, no, you know. No. 
there was no language for it. It's like, if you have feelings, you need to go hide. And so that really created a sense. I think you've heard me share this before. You know, one of my core wounds is I'm too much, mm. you know, I'm too needy and I'm too much. And it's like, well, yeah, if you grow up with a parent that's overwhelmed and is single and is highly sensitive and anxious and doesn't know if she's going to be able to provide, mm -hmm. then yeah, everything probably was too much for her. And it wasn't about me, but as kids, our our survival depends on our love for our parents. And so what we do is we turn it around and make it about ourselves. And the beautiful thing is my mom lives with us now. We've done some incredible healing and repair work. We've talked about all of these injuries and we've really moved our relationship to a very beautiful place, which is why I feel comfortable sharing about it. We all can move from a place that really didn't serve us very well as kids and do an incredible amount of healing and have these amazing lives. Mm. It's so heartening to hear that, that you were able to still have the time and the connection to go through all this with your mother. Like that's a huge gift. I feel really blessed. I feel really blessed. It took a lot because my job was to caretake her mm -hmm. because I was an HSP. I could read what she needed. And so I was really able to attune. And we were talking recently. Had I not been an HSP, it probably would have been really hard for her because I wouldn't have been able to to manage and regulate as much as I did because I just would have been being me and all over the place. So anyways, we do best when we have a reason to stop with the internal focus. Sure. I really believe that the purpose of emotion is that compass on a map nine times out of 10 where the map is leading us to is connection, right? We need those other people and we needed to find a way to be of service. Interesting. I know that as a highly sensitive person that because I was so in tune with other people that the way that I got my value and praised by was being there and being supportive and doing a mm -hmm. lot of caretaking and caregiving. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got a lot of accolades. It, it wasn't necessarily the best thing for me. No. And I think, you know, with the overlay of being a female and, you know, being nice and yeah. being kind and, you know, all of those ways that we get molded to fit in to help other people and really lose that sense of who we are and our sense of power. I'm not sure it was necessarily the best thing for me, but I think that's true for many HSPs and the tendency to pair up with people that tend to be on the more narcissistic side because we're so good at fitting in with other people until we really have a sense of who we are and where we start and where we begin and we know what we're willing to accept and not take. I feel like I'm going down a little rabbit hole. I don't know. <laughs> it, it resonates with me. The the need to be needed sure the the want to have your kind of emotionality validated i remember i had getting to be a therapist and i'm, I'm really curious as to as if this has been part of your experience as well before i was a therapist i had people i considered friends that would only reach out once every three to four years when they were in a crisis and would not speak to me otherwise interesting and I really valued having the capacity to be there for all those folks. And there were quite a few. And then all of a sudden, when I started actually practicing therapy, I didn't have the space for those relationships anymore. Sure. Because I was already giving so much of that part of my bandwidth to my clients. That makes sense. And I had, and I asked around and a number of other therapists had gone through similar things. I basically had to start giving them the option of, no, I'm not going to be here for this right now. I've given you resources for what you're struggling with. If you want to stay connected with me, call me when you're not in crisis sometime. Wow, that's a great boundary. It wasn't easy. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> that sounds very smooth when I say it in that sentence. <laughs> sure, sure. Did you have a similar experience after being kind of molded towards that? And push towards that? No, you know, I don't think that I, I only think it's been pretty recently that I really am having a sense of what my strengths and gifts are. I oh. chase a lot of relationships. I put way mm. more energy and time into them. I run pretty deep and pretty intense. And that makes most people pretty darn uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. so I probably sought out relationships that continued to validate that I was too much and too needy and thought too much and analyzed too much. I don't feel like I had very many really reciprocal relationships. And when I hear people talk about this is how I am as a therapist, this is how I am as a friend, like 
pretty much what you see is what you get. And whether you're my friend mm. or I'm a therapist, I show up the same way just because it's, it's how I am. So that really wasn't my experience. But I can totally see how that could be someone's experience. Mm. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. The the mentors I have that I got lucky enough to you know, be in the room with either, either as an observer or a co-therapist, what I noticed about the folks that really had settled into the art of the field, mm -hmm. they weren't any different with their clients yeah. than they were with their friends and their supervisees. The, the roles and kind of the hierarchy, right? If they're a supervisor uh, or something like that was still there, but it was such a natural state of listening and communicating for them that it didn't change. And I have those moments but I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. I, I still really value kind of the, the hats that I wear. Sure. But I do think what that tells me is that you're, you're probably a very, very good proficient therapist. If you can show up in both ways or in both settings, the same way, I should say like that's the, the goal. I don't know if it's a function of age. You know, I'm, I'm in my fifties now. Mm. I don't know if we just get to a point where we don't care anymore. And I don't <laughs> <laughs> like, this is me, you know, for good or bad, this is what you get. Yeah. And I can remember being in my twenties and I was dating this guy and his mom's best friend was someone who just showed up and was totally how she was. And I loved it. And it astounded me. Like you could actually say what you were thinking. I feel mm -hmm. like I've gotten to the point where I just am going to be who I am. And the people that can't tolerate it are going to fall away from me. And the people that can tolerate it are going to draw closer to me. And it is funny. Um, my kids just started college and I was having what I thought was a very loving conversation with one of them who was having some adjustment, some, you know, just some bumps. And he said to me, you know, stop talking to me like I'm a client. <laughs> that was not the thing to say to me. <laughs> and I said, okay, right. fine. You don't want me to talk to you like a client? And I just gave it to him pretty straightforward and down and dirty in it. And I said to him, this is how I talk to everybody. If you don't want me to talk to you that way, then I'm more than happy to give it to you just straight. It was not kind. It was not empathic. And he's like, okay, I'm ready to hang up now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, my little parenting perils. There you go. So Tim, I would love to have you tell us about your podcast, the name of it, what it's about, where people can find it, where people can find you, because you have so many wonderful things to offer. And the services that you provide? My practice is out here in Colorado in the greater Denver area. I do individual therapy, primarily focused on men, veterans, and first responders. I also do education. So I go and I talk about uh, masculinity, how to better connect with it as a community and how to cope with it. I train other therapists on how to work with addiction, anger, and the veteran community. And for my podcast, for those of you that aren't in Colorado, it's called Stories and Lessons. A lot of it is right now is my personal stories around different points in my life that where I felt were pivotal and I took lessons from. Which are amazing, amazing, captivating. My guess is if you're listening to this podcast and you're enjoying it, you will love to listen to Tim's stories. Thank you so much. That means a lot. The stories are really good. My approach as a therapist is narrative. So the story of our lives, what it means to us. So it felt like a really natural progression. But then I'm also collecting stories from other men in the helping profession. I've had fellow veteran advocates come on. I've had uh, my, my favorite most recent one was I had a child therapist who I, I highly recommend in Denver for any children really, really struggling. He's got a great approach. Why don't you tell us his name in case anybody's listening in Denver and needs it? Jeff Silverman. He, we had a wonderful story about kind of the shame of parental mistakes and how that's key to the survival of the species in his view. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Wow. So that's been fun for me just to kind of normalize for myself, but also just to help guys have a sense of what is out there and that so many of these things that we isolate in and think are just on our own are absolutely normal and don't have to be the way life is. And then do you have a website where people can find you? All of these things can be found at www.empoweredchangece.com. Like 
Sounds great. Is there anything else before we go, Tim? This has just been, I was just sitting here reflecting, like, it's just amazing where podcasting and support and just being open and vulnerable has taken us. And I'm just smiling and feeling happy. Uh, what I would leave people with, uh, particularly any of your, your male listeners, is that don't get intimidated by the terms. Notice what people are talking about. That's what brought me to this. When I hear highly sensitive, that immediately has kind of a knee-jerk reaction. But when I hear P Patricia talk about what the experience is like, when I hear other men talk about how to get in touch with their emotions, it's important to take the tools. If nothing else, start there and then see where the identity takes you. Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Tim, thank you so much for taking time to hop on with me today. This has just been delightful. Thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful you took the time to listen. If any of the stories resonated with you and you find yourself struggling with relationships, or communication, or feeling misunderstood, or feeling that your sensitivity isn't okay, and you're interested in working with me, I work with anyone who lives in California in an online secure platform, which means that we meet over something called Zoom, which is like Skype. So you don't even have to leave your house. If you live in San Diego, I also meet with people in person. You can head over to my website, Patricia Young lcsw.com for more information. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day.